Good morning, everybody. My name is Alice Richardson. I'm a biostatistician from Population Health at the ANU, and it's a great pleasure to be um, chairing this session this morning. Our first speaker is Dr. Ron Davis, um, Director of the Stanford Genome Technology Center and a Professor of Biochemistry and Genetics at the Stanford School of Medicine in Stanford, California. He's considered to be a world leader in biotechnology and in the development and application of recombinant DNA and genomic methods to biological systems. His lab has developed many of the techniques currently used in academic and industrial biotechnology laboratories. In particular, he was instrumental in the development of DNA microarray technology. We're delighted to have you here this morning, Ron, um, and very much looking forward to your presentation, Establishing New Mechanistic and Diagnostic Paradigms for MECFS. Let's welcome Ron Davis. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as the plane was landing in, um, in Australia uh, and I had to fill out the customs form, um, I mean, I thought I almost wouldn't make it here uh, because in that custom form it said, have you ever been convicted of a crime? And I thought, oh gosh, if I say no, they won't let me in. <laughs> So I, uh, I took a chance and, and, be, and, and was honest, and I checked no, and I guess they didn't notice. So, uh, so I'm here. But it is an honor to be here. Uh, I, this is my fourth trip to Australia. I really like Australia. Um, Uh, this, uh, this first slide is to uh, acknowledging uh, the support I've had to do the research. And uh, uh, my son is very ill with the disease. Um, I decided I had to start working on it, which many people have. I mean, it almost seems like half the researchers have a, a loved one uh, with the disease. And, um, but of course, being a scientist, I wrote grants to NIH uh, to no avail. And uh, it's important to understand the scientific method. And, and, and apparently, our, our National Institute of Health does not understand it. And uh, the, the scientific method is observation. From the observations, you put together a hypothesis. And you need to put together a hypothesis that can be tested, not a hypothesis there's no way to test. That's useless. So you have to put together a testable hypothesis, and then you test it. And your whole effort is to prove yourself wrong. And when I talk to lay people, I said, you know, what scientists do is they constantly try to prove themselves wrong. And when they fail to prove themselves wrong, then we have success. <laughs> so her whole life is trying to prove herself wrong and, and, and constant failure. <laughs> And that's how we made progress. Um, and of course, the NIH turned down the, uh, the proposal because it was a fishing expedition. There was no clear hypothesis. And I said, well, you can't have a hypothesis without observation. And there was very little in the way of observation that would generate a molecular, I'm a molecular person, uh, a molecular hypothesis. So we need to generate observation first. Well, that's just a fishing expedition. I said, absolutely. When you want to catch fish, you go fishing. <laughs> so um, <coughs> without funds, had to figure out what to do, and um, uh, I teamed up with uh, Lynn and Tannenbaum, who was raising funds for this, and uh, she said that she knew how to raise funds but had no idea how to direct the research. And I said, I know how to do research. I don't know how to raise funds. So we did a combination. She does the fundraising, I do the research. Now, the research idea here is not that I fund my own lab and I do everything myself. I know how to do some things, but I don't know how to do everything by, by any means. And so um, the concept was to speed this up. Um, we would have, uh, we would generate a lot of data, which I knew how to do. Uh, we would then put that data up on a web server before we publish and make it universally accessible. Now that's been a daunting task and one thing we want to have it done at Stanford and we have to poke a hole in the, 
and the firewall at Stanford, which Winzong, who's going to talk after me, has spent quite a bit of time <laughs> figuring out how to do, uh, because Stanford did not want this to happen. Uh, but we had to do it that way. And so it took, it's taken a long time to get the thing up and working, uh, and then actually you put the data into that. But that's the whole idea, is to make it available to anybody, because there's a lot of smart people out in the world. And uh, if they have the data, they don't need to have a laboratory. And so, in fact, if we do this with uh, even other people can, do, can, can, can use this site if they'd like to and put their data up as well. Now, of course, you can do it in the publication, but it's probably far more efficient if you have one site that you can go to and find everything. That's the idea. The other idea is the fact that uh, if we can raise enough money, then we could fund lots of other laboratories. And uh, unfortunately, I don't want to set up where people will apply for grants because then I become NIH. And um, probably I'll get in the same boat. <laughs> um, I, I would rather do it the way the Genome Project was done following Jim Watson's ideas. And that was you don't put up money and, and ask for uh, applications. You go to people that you know have a good track record and you simply tell them to do it. And that's what he did. And he simply met with me for dinner one night and said, you're going to sequence the yeast genome. And I said, yes, sir. <laughs> and, uh, and that's what got me into the Genome Project. And, uh, and that's why the Genome Project was so successful is because uh, it was all people with very good track records got into it initially because Jim forced them into it. Uh, I say, like the same uh, concept here is to get good people. Uh, uh, and good people are always busy, so sometimes you have to twist their arm. So, um, to start out, uh, how to get started, I thought we should try to do something that might be mo more useful than just generating a lot of data, because there was quite a bit of data out there. We should try to collect data that was not out there. And uh, I noticed that nobody had really ever looked at severe patients before. And, uh, and that's because they don't come to clinics. They're, they're bedbound. And so you have to go to them. And so most of the data comes from physicians that run clinics. And in fact, what happens with these, uh, the patients sometimes wait until they are feeling good before they go to the doctor. So the doctor only sees them at their best. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that, in fact, may uh, distort the data as well. So we decided we had to do severe patients. We had to go to them, collect it. And we wanted to collect large, large amounts of data. And so I'm just giving you a, this, you don't have to really read this. I'm just going to show you that, you know, uh, we, we have a lot of omics capacity. We can do all these things. We've developed a lot of the methods for that. Uh, immunology, I'm not an expert in, but Mark Davis is, who is a colleague of mine, uh, and we'll use his facility for that. Um, and then we have a lot of, uh, technology that we've developed at the lab and are currently uh, continuing to develop technology, we'll use all of that technology and, and put it up um, for evaluation. Now, as we go through a lot of these, it was very, very clear very, very early that this is a systemic disease. Now, what happens often with clinicians is they measure a few things, liver function, kidney function, heart function, you know, they look at cholesterol levels and those kinds of things. And when they do this on a patient, they look perfectly healthy. And, I'm, and then when we start looking at this, it's clearly that's probably the only thing uh, that's in the patients that looks healthy. <laughs> and uh, you have to look a lot deeper. And so, um, I, I want to show you a picture of my son, and I want to show you that because uh, it, when you do that st standard analysis on him in this state, he's perfectly healthy. You cannot distinguish him from a, from a track star if, if you don't see him. <laughs> and so that's one of the problems I think we have in the disease is this distortion that there's nothing wrong with him. There's a lot wrong with him. And it's a very, very serious disease. And so, um, in fact, it was actually my son when he was st still able to talk. Um, 
who said that when uh, he heard about the PACE trial and that they recommended exercise, he said, these people are absolutely nuts. It makes you worse. Well, exploring that a little bit, that's absolutely true. The recommended procedure of, of, of doing exercise, graded exercise, is absolutely nuts. And it makes them worse. So in fact, one of the diagnostic criteria for this disease is uh, uh, post-exertional malaise or, or post-exertional intolerance. So that if you do exercise, you get worse. That's a diagnostic criteria. And how in the world can, ind can governments recommend exercise? It's barbaric. And it's extremely barbaric. And it's barbaric to the extent of, in fact, it's sort of government-sponsored malpractice. And I think we need to think of that as malpractice. It's clear evidence that that's not the right thing to do. How in the world can it continue? And so I just want to put that on the record. So in my case, as my son, this is a fair case, he would be often thought of a malingerer. Uh, he wants to be sick. Uh, here's a person that has laid in that bed for six years. Uh, we get to change his sheets about every three months because he can't tolerate us being in the room. He cannot talk. He cannot eat. He cannot look at us. We have a tube into the top of his intestine for feeding. He cannot drink. So we have another uh, line uh, into his chest that goes into his heart for giving him saline. We have to do that, go in every day to do that. We go in a prescribed time so he knows it's going to happen and he has to cover up his face so he doesn't accidentally see us in the room. And he basically meditates while we're in there to, to, to not uh, get too, uh, too extreme. <clears throat> he also says, uh, in sign language, that he cannot kill himself. Because he said, there are some people who will not kill themselves because they're not as bad as he is and that keeps them going. And if he were to kill himself, they would feel the, the, the ability to kill themselves. So he promises he will not kill himself. And it's not for him, it's for everybody else. So I would challenge uh, any of the government officials to say that this is not real. There's nothing wrong. To look at the data and look at the patients. This is not the only patient like this. There's thousands and thousands of people like this. So, um, uh, what we uh, decided to do sort of early on is that, uh, in just talking to the patients, that they felt that they had constant viral infections. I went to a lot of meetings, a lot of patient meetings. Uh, they said, That's, it's, it's the constant viral infections that are keeping me sick. And I would ask them, how do you know you have a viral infection? Well, I feel like it would be one, one answer. Second answer is, oh, I have high antibody titer to HHV6 or EBV or something like that. And my son has high antibody titer to HHV6 and EBV. So we said, well, that's not, that's just as you had it doesn't mean you have an active infection. So I began to talk to the infectious disease people. There's a lot of startup companies in the area. Uh, and they said that, uh, uh, in fact, it was Dr. Ron Tompkins, who I've worked with for years, uh, that the blood is actually the sewer, sewer of the body. And everything gets dumped into it. And then sorted out, good stuff gets taken out, and the bad stuff gets excreted. And that's how the body works. So everything's in there. And if you have an infection anywhere in the body, the nucleic acid from that infectious organism will find its way into the blood. So all you have to do is look for the nucleic acid. But we need a really sensitive method. And there's lots and lots of pathogens. So we have to t try to devise ways to do that effectively. So we teamed up initially with Eric DeWald, who, who we've worked with a number of years, um, <clears throat> who does do, is a virus hunter. He's found a large number 
of new viruses uh, and all over the world. And so he, what he does is isolate the nucleic acid and then we sequence it. And that's a problem because you're likely to find a microbe that you've never seen before. But it will be related to something that is out there. So what we do is take all the different traces, this is a massive undertaking, and search it against everything that's ever been sequenced. That requires a large, large cluster computer. We use the large cluster computer at Stanford. Uh, when we were doing this study, we dominated it. We used it half, half the time we were on it uh, uh, until we eventually got kicked off because we were overusing it. Um, but we managed to do the study, <clears throat> and that said, we didn't find anything, except something called TT viruses. Every patient was found with the TT viruses. And um, that's a nice internal control because everybody has TT viruses. So, so yes, the patients are infected, but so are we all. <laughs> and we don't understand it. And uh, you, you acquire this virus shortly after birth, uh, presumably from the mother, and it doesn't seem to do anything. However, we don't really know that because we don't have anybody that doesn't have it. <laughs> and since you get it at birth, it's really tough to figure out. But it's in your bloodstream. It grows and replicates. So it's a nice internal control. Interestingly, the patients have lower level of the TT viruses than healthy people. And I, I assume that's probably because they have a heightened uh, innate immunity going on and that suppresses it slightly. It's, they're not gone, they're just lower level. Uh, <clears throat> so that was the first pass saying we don't find anything new, but it wasn't super, super sensitive. Um, and so we decided we had to do a, a different method that was higher sensitivity and that involved direct searching for a particular virus using the polymerase chain reaction. However, there's hundreds and hundreds of viruses. And if we do those one at a time, it's going to cost a fortune per patient. So we said, okay, what we have to do is develop a technology where we can simultaneously do them in a single tube. And that's what we kind of do. That's, those are the kind of things we take on. Um, and so uh, this was... Uh, uh, developed by Padong Shen, who's a, a physical chemist by training. Uh, he, he's excellent at these kinds of technologies and, uh, and developed uh, a multiplex PCR. Now, he had already started doing some of this stuff even before we asked him to do the viruses uh, because we had been working on cystic fibrosis for a while earlier on before this chronic, chronic fatigue syndrome efforts. And uh, what was clear was needed uh, was a newborn screen by direct sequencing because there were lots and lots of alleles and some new ones that you missed. So the best way to do it is to sequence the entire gene. Well, that's expensive. So he worked out a way in which he could amplify up all the regions of the cystic fibrosis gene, barcode the pieces, combine them together with lots of different patients and run them all together in one sequence run. <clears throat> and he then got that cost down to $10 for the diagnostic test. <clears throat> He's now going on to uh, do a more challenging problem, and that is to, to do the same kind of concept, but do it on all of the genes involved in um, uh, inborn errors and metabolism. And uh, so far he's gotten up to ability to simultaneously amplify up 500 regions and sequence them uh, in many, many people at the same time, and the cost per sample is $10. And that was set um, by the state of California in newborn screening. You can do newborn screening, but it has to be done for $10 or less. So that eliminates a lot of technologies, uh, but he can do it with this. So the, the, the uh, cystic fibrosis is used at Stanford for, for new, newborns, and it's being tested for the state of California, and we'll move it, uh, the uh, inborn errors will be done soon. I'm going to show you this because this is a scientific symposium, some of the details for this. And um, um, it's something that um, th 
This is not new, but he sort of perfected the, some of the details to make it more effective. And, and, and what it is is you want to amplify up this region, and so you make primers for that region, but then you put on a, what's called a homo tail. It's a, a sequence that he's designed that doesn't interfere with anything, uh, and this is that primer. And the trick was the design of this primer, the design of that primer, and the relative concentrations of the two to make this work. And so you, you amplify up the region with these specific primers, and then every gene has a different set of specific ones, but they use the same tails. And it's a homo tail, meaning that this one is the same as that one. And what that does is that if you don't amplify something here, then these two are very close together, and by having the same one, they are actually homologous, and they snap together, and that takes it out of the solution because the, the, um, dimer, uh, uh, the dimer primers are really the problem is a lot of these things don't work very well. <clears throat> and then uh, you come in with a second amplification after you do this one. And, and then these, th th these are all done in, in one tube. So you can do 500 of these simultaneously in one tube. And then you put on the, the sequencing primers, and there's some tricks to doing that as well that he worked out. So that you, and then you put a bar, you have to get a barcode in them as well, so you know which sample it is, because you do multiple samples simultaneously. Um, and then it goes into the sequencer, and that's how you get the cost down. <coughs> so um, I asked him to do uh, the the viruses, and we start, we started out with the DNA viruses. Um, and that was because uh, of the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, Epstein virus was one of the things that p patients thought they had, and herpes 6 and 7, or, or even 8, uh, uh, these are the ones that patients uh, said that they had constant infections of. And, and then we don't just pick one area, because there could be a reason that that doesn't work. So we pick multiple regions of each virus. And that's what, these are the number of probes that are for each virus. So we need to have a positive for all of them to make sure we, we're seeing it correctly. And that helps to reduce false positive and, and false negatives. Now, incidentally, since there's some physicians here, it's very common in medical tests to have a 10% false positive, 10% false negative. And it's all up to the FDA in, in the U.S. and other government agencies of what they accept. And they're pretty tolerant. And I'm arguing to the scientific community, we can do better. We really need to get the, the false positive, false negatives down below 1%. And I think it's doable. Because doctors don't understand those things very well. And, uh, and then they can get actually a misdiagnosis because of it, or lack of diagnosis. So here's the results of that from the 20, so we picked 20 severe patients, and this is the result from the 20 severe patients. Yes, there's one that has EBV, three of them have HHV7, but so do the healthy controls. Now, this is not a large amount of virus. This is not a raging infection positive. This is just saying, I, we can find a DNA molecule, <laughs> right? And so we know these viruses you have for life, and they leak. And so this is probably the leakage. And if we came back and tested these patients again, which we, we should do, um, we may find it negative, and other people are positive. Now, I tested my son multiple times, and he's always been negative. So th this conclusion is, and we're, we're now going to do this test now, uh, routinely now. We're going to do it on every patient that comes in. We're going to test them for the viruses uh, and look for a raging infection and just keep a log of it. But it, 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 this would say it doesn't look like uh, they have constant uh, viral infection. Now, uh, the other thing, um, back up a second. Um, I began looking through a number of, what else could they have? Look, and, and looking at symptoms of a number of different diseases because maybe we've misdiagnosed this. And I discovered that there's a, uh, in, in sleeping sickness, uh, 
I didn't know why it was called sleeping sickness. It turns out it's called sleeping sickness because the patients switched their light di day cycle. We, chronic, uh, severe MEPCFS patients do the same thing. And other than that, the symptoms are the same, fatigue and so forth. So maybe it's a parasite. My son got sick in India, lots of parasites. So we decided we had to look at all the parasite sequences and, uh, and especially the trypanosomes. And uh, the major one is tr trypanosome brucei, and, uh, which is the sleeping sickness. Uh, it's carried by the tsetse fly. We don't have tsetse flies. We don't have them, I don't think, in Australia. We certainly don't have them in, the, in North America. However, in talking to infectious disease people uh, at Stanford, they say, yeah, there are some trypanosomes. There's one for horses. And, uh, but it doesn't have, apparently it doesn't have a vector. But you can catch it from a horse. And it's a blood-to-blood -blood transfer. And in fact, just north of us, there was a person who came down with it. So uh, didn't get in the news. Uh, then there's another one, uh, Trabanzone prusii, it's called Chagas disease. Um, that's one that, that was possibly uh, Charles Darwin picked up when he was in the Americas. Um, and of course, there's a whole bunch of others. Uh, they, many of these have been sequenced. Uh, the diagnosis for these diseases uh, is finding the parasite. So when I was in Africa, I met a fellow uh, just outside of Nairobi that studied these, uh, who was an expert. So I finally remembered his name after 40 years uh, and called him up. Of course, he's retired, but I did track him down on the web and ask him about these, you know, how easy it is to find it in the blood. He says, well, for Brucei, it's trivial, but there's other species that it's really hard to find. Now, they're in Africa, so they have the symptoms, so they're treated. Well, what if you had somebody in the US? You would miss it. <laughs> and so it was still, it, it, it meant it was a possibility to explore. Well, then there's other things as well. There's leishmania. There's a lot of different types. Um, there's some characteristics that, but those might be missed. Uh, and they might be different with a different kind of organism. Uh, uh, and what we're looking for is something that's spread throughout the world that has been missed because it isn't, uh, it doesn't kill, and it may not proliferate extremely well, so it's hard to find. So if we're looking for some kind of infectious disease, we have to, it, it, we have to assume that it's bif difficult to diagnose. Uh, uh, incidentally, uh, just to do a comparison, uh, if we had an HIV patient, uh, years ago and we took our blood sample from them and, do, and, and do, use these kind of techniques, it would take us about 24 hours to figure out HIV. Absolutely slam dunk easy. So we're talking about something very hard to find is the assumption. So we have to look very hard. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of tick-borne uh, illnesses. Uh, they carry lots of different things. Uh, we need to put in all the sequences for those as well. Um, and, uh, and uh, including uh, plasmodium, uh, it grows in the red cells. Uh, so we're making probes for all of them. We do know that Giardia, uh, there was an, uh, a Giardia infection in Norway uh, in 1990 uh, that caused chronic fatigue syndrome, so that's definitely a candidate. So anyway, we're going through all these different things that people have observed. And now, keeping in mind, we've done the general DNA sequence comparison, so if it were something that we hadn't thought of, which is less sensitive technique, but if it were pretty common in the person, we would have also found it. Here we're just looking for traces of these in the person. So this is a, um, oops, so these are this, the, uh, the, the, the current effort to find a, 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 a pathogen. And so far it's all negative, but we're gonna to continue to look. Now what's missing right here are the RNA viruses, because they're hard. So we put that one off. And now uh, we're going back and we're gonna do all the RNA viruses as well. Um, 
So there's other things that we can use this technology for, uh, and that is for targeted sequencing. And uh, Barbara Fair is going to talk about this. I'm just going to show you this. Uh, is that we, we can look for damaging mutations uh, on a specific sequence basis. So he's going to talk about uh, a, 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 a hypothesis that involves uh, uh, indirectly IDO2, uh, and we've looked at IDO2. Uh, we did it in the severe patients. N all of them have a mutation. Uh, we then looked at uh, more patients that came to the lab that, we, that were diagnosed by an expert, because one of the problems in doing some of this thing is misdiagnosis. And sometimes we get patients in that have done self-diagnosis. We don't know if it's correct or not. So we only, all the da molecular data comes from patients that have been diagnosed by an expert, in addition to having the symptoms, the correct symptoms collect collection. Um, so, so all of these additional patients also have a damaging mutation. So that's what we're looking for. Is there a mutation that is common to all the patients? This is one example of that. There possibly are others. And I'm not going to talk any more about this. Rob will give you a detail about what the, why, why that's important. Well, we also used this uh, same technology to look at mitochondria. Uh, we looked for mitochondrial mutations. We can amplify up the entire mitochondria. But this technology is also set up to be quantitative. And so we can tell you how much virus load you have and so forth. It's, it's very quantitative. Uh, and we can do this with the amount of mitochondrial DNA. Do they have less mitochondrial DNA? And there was a talk about this er 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 earlier. Uh, that they didn't see any difference. Well, we don't see any difference either between healthy controls and patients. Um, now moving on a little bit to the uh, looking at the immune system. Uh, you can look, this is easy to do. You can send a sample. Uh, in our case, we send it to the Immune Monitoring Corps at Stanford, run by Mark Davis. And this is just a way to display all these. This is a, a 63 plex, of, uh, uh, and all we're putting on here is a healthy control in one color. What most of the patients that come to the clinic is in green, and then the severe patients are in red. And they have barely not been looked at before. And what you can see is that there's a lot more uh, cytokine uh, in the severe patients. That seems to be generally true. hard to interpret exactly what any one of those actually means. Uh, but, uh, but also what Mark Davis's group did a, a pilot study looking at T cells. Uh, I, we've talked about this before. And in comparing MS and cystic fibrosis and Lyme's patients versus healthy controls, what was found is there's a lot of activation uh, in the T cells. And so that was a possibility that this T cell activation was actually responsible for a lot of the disease, that it was an autoimmune disease. <clears throat> but this is only for patients, so we decided that we had to, uh, to look a lot deeper. And so we've been looking deeper on it. This is just, just, just a, 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 a beginning com a, of that. And when we look at a lot more patients and a lot more healthy controls, the differences are sliding to, starting to disappear. And uh, Yes, there are a lot of healthy controls that show almost no amplification, but then there's others that show a fair amount of amplification. Uh, and then when our CFS patients, uh, there are some that show very little, and then some that show a lot. Um, I think it's this, I think it's this patient right here that we later found out uh, after we worked with this person, uh, she was diagnosed with cancer. So this one has to come out. <laughs> Uh, this is probably a cancer response. So the net result of that is that we're not sure that there's really a significant difference between the patient. Now, some people could say, oh, look, gee, I thought we were on the track of figuring this out. That's very disappointing. I, I would remind you that this is the great news. <laughs> because if you have a T cell autoimmune disease, uh, not clear how we're going to solve it, at least anytime soon. So I'm actually thrilled with this result. <laughs> because it means it's something else that maybe we can cure. This one would be difficult. So 
So the other thing that we work on is trying to figure out some diagnostic tools. Uh, this disease is hard to diagnose, and I'll show you a few of those. I've talked about this before, but I'll just give you an update on it. Uh, and for those who um, haven't heard about this, one of, the, one of the technologies that seems to be the most effective is something uh, that we call a nanonatal biosensor. And it involves a, 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 a trough. This is all nanofabricated. And then there are these electrodes that come into it. Uh, the electrodes um, are 50 nanometers uh, and are spaced about 50, 100 nanometers apart. So there's two electrodes. Now, a nanometer is not much. <laughs> And you can't, you can't see these electrodes by eye. Um, and, and we put in uh, 2,500 of them. Uh, and, and there are two electrodes coming into the, and this is the blood sample goes in here. So we just put a drop of blood into this detector. And we can get 2,500 readings from that. And we sample it uh, 200 times a second. So that it gives you a massive amount of data. And if any one electrode doesn't work right, it doesn't make any difference because you're sampling so often and with so many electrodes. The concept was if we stressed, and we were thinking cells, if we stress the cells that the patients can't tolerate stress, maybe the cells can't either. So we put in sodium chloride. It's just 50% over normal because they will have to pump it out, and that's a stress. And what happened with that uh, then um, was that we got a very clear signal. <laughs> so what happens is that when you add the salt, which is added right here, with healthy patients, it, the, the additional salt, cause, and this is measuring electrical impedance. I'm not going to go into the detail of what that means. But it's a very sensitive measurement. Uh, this drop is just because of the salt being added to the blood. And now it's perfectly stable with healthy people and you can go out much further. They handle it just fine. However, with the, uh, with the MECFS patients, this is very characteristic. Uh, there is a bigger drop, don't know why. And then there is an, an increase and then a plateau. Now, um, I'm gonna show you a bunch of them, just to show you, uh, uh, oh, this is, um, the one reason to pursue this is that it's very inexpensive, uh, and you can get this answer in real time. So it's not you send off the sample and wait a week. Uh, you could, uh, it's, just, it's a handheld, well, it, it could be made into a handheld uh, device. It could be put in a doctor's office, for example. Um, <clears throat> um, so it's just really the, the response to sodium chloride. Uh, and we, we're thinking maybe it could be used uh, as a diagnostic, but also what is happening here is if we had a drug that uh, made the cells healthier, then we would see that in this pattern. And so that it might be used for drug screening. Uh, that's just a possibility. Um, and here's a, here, here's a bunch of samples. And the blue is our healthy people, and the red lines are uh, severe, are not severe, I'm sorry. The severe are in here, but these are a lot of patients, many of which are not severe. Um, and we see, and we draw in a line here uh, that they have to go above, uh, equal to or above this line to be diagnosed, and, and they, uh, they have to be, uh, for healthy people, have to be below this one. Um, and, and this is 20, uh, we're now at something over 30, uh, same kind of result. The probability that you can get this statistically, <laughs> uh, is 10 to the minus nine, that, it just by random chance. So that's a pretty good diagnostic, if it's, if it's really reflecting the disease, which we don't yet know. We have started some drug screenings. Uh, we have found two drugs that get rid of the signal. And now we have to figure out why. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a bit optimism. It looks like those two drugs are probably affecting the mitochondria. And uh, that, that's what we have to, we have to follow that up. Um, and, and before we even try some kind of clinical trial. <clears throat> but I'm optimistic that we might find something. Um, <clears throat> 
Now we've developed an, another technology, and that's what we, 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 the idea is to develop a number of approaches because we can't count on any one working right. Uh, and we decided to look at blood. Uh, and I'm just showing you this picture so to remind you of the red cells are very odd in shape. They're kind of a donut shape. Uh, and, and, and it's probably so that they can squeeze through capillaries. And so um, we've developed um, a, 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 a flow device. Uh, this is a collaboration uh, with a group. And uh, th this has allowed us to actually bring in some engineers. This was started by Anand, who's a bioengineer at San Jose State. And uh, then we went to uh, two other uh, professors of engineering, one in mechanical engineering, one in chemical, uh, to help us out in this. Uh, Juan Santiago is a, a fabulous designer of instruments, m m big little tiny instruments. Uh, he's world famous for doing this. He's very excited about this. And Eric uh, is a computational person. And, the, and on the computation of how this all works is incredibly complex. And, uh, but he has access to the U U.S. Defense Department computers. And so he's been using the Defense Department computers just to tell the patients the military in the U.S. is helping them. <laughs> um, and in fact has done a lot, uh, finished some of their early computations of how cells enter a tube. And, and the reason to do that is to try to figure out uh, exactly how to design it. And one of the problems you have, if, 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 if the blood cells were spheres, it would mean no problem. They're not spheres. Uh, they ha and they have to get squeezed to get into the capillaries. So it depends on if they come from the side or the middle, they'll behave differently. And it depends on whether they go in exactly end on or go in this way. Uh, it makes a difference. So they're designing how you, how you design this whole thing and how long you have to wait before you sample them. And otherwise, you get a lot of variance. And I, I think we can eliminate. So the new, there's a new design. We just finished that new design. It hasn't been tested yet. Uh, that uh, <coughs> we're, we're hoping. Now, uh, this isn't new. In fact, Simpson uh, years ago thought there was probably some deformability issues. Uh, D David Bell. Uh, his blood volume uh, reviews also suggested there might be deformability issues. There were no testing done, um, but there are other diseases where there is deformability uh, seen. I've highlighted that when people become septic, um, there's a deformability issue. Um, it's not quite clear that this test will make it uh, perfect because there's these other diseases, but my guess is that we can probably distinguish uh, uh, <clears throat> things like diabetes, sepsis, and, and, and parasite. Now, of course, the, the fact that there's a parasite uh, comes back saying, oh, that's what we were looking for before, a parasite. Um, so we have to keep in mind, uh, again, that, uh, that we keep looking for these parasites. But it's possible that this is a, uh, and I'm going to show you uh, uh, some measurements and uh, uh, what, we, what we've been looking at is how fast they get into the capillary, uh, how fast they move, and how much they get elongated. Those are just some of the measurements that are made. And, uh, and then I'm going to show you very quickly some of the data. So, it, and the, the CFS are in red and healthy controls are in green. And you can see that at entry time there is a slight difference. And um, if you look at transit, um, velocity. Uh, there's differences there. And also you should notice that it's not enormously different. Uh, and this is the elongation index. Um, and one of the reasons, um, and here's the cell length. There's a pretty good difference in cell length. Um, whoops. Uh, but that's why we're doing the modeling. One of the problems with this is that there's a lot of variance. Uh, we need to get rid of the variance and then it might be a good diagnostic. So the, it has to do with the, helping the, the modeling, helping the design the device so that we get, it has a lot less, there is a difference, but we need to amplify that difference to make it something useful. Now, as typical of a bioengineer who started this stuff with us, 
uh, you take the, you, you, you want to make it kind of clean chemically. And that is you take it out of the serum and put it into a phosphate buffer, and then you do it. Well, I'm a advocate of keep it the way it was and make it simpler. Don't have to process it, just stick it in. So if you just leave it in the serum, um, you get a bigger difference. <laughs> And so I think the new experiments will all use serum instead of phosphate buffer. And it also simplifies the protocol. Um, and that comes back to our other experiments where we're looking at the impedance changes. Uh, we assumed it was the cells. Well, it turns out if you take the cells, MECFS cells, out of the plasma and put in healthy cells, it looks pretty much the same. There's something not quantitatively the same, but you still get the same kind of signal. So the net result of that, there's something in the plasma and there's something in the cell that causes a signal. Uh, it would be very interesting to find out what it is in the plasma. Unfortunately, there's a lot of stuff in the plasma. Uh, so you can do some gross characterization. It's something big. Uh, it could be a small particle, uh, or it could be something a very high molecular weight. Uh, we haven't gone much past that because we thought, well, maybe it's a metabolite, and that would be somewhat easy to figure out with mass spectrometry. It's not that simple, so we have kind of put it on the back shelf. But there is something in the plasma that's doing this. Of course, that then suggests that, well, maybe you could uh, do plasmapheresis and help. Maybe. How, depends on how fast it comes back. <laughs> and, and we don't know what it is, so we don't know what that is, but it's possible. So, um, and I'm going to move on to this, but we, we're now doing what we call a bake-off. Uh, uh, which of these methods works the best, or which combination works the best? So, uh, uh, you've heard about the seahorse instrument from other talks. Uh, we're using that as well. Um, we have another device, which I haven't talked about, is a magnetic levitation. It's a real simple device, very inexpensive. It costs five cents to do it. Uh, it might be, uh, uh, it might be, it might work. And then there's Robert Navio who's done the metabolomics. So uh, each sample that comes in, uh, we run on all these instruments. Uh, we save a sample for the metabolomics because we need to do those all uh, together so there's not a batch effect. And then we'll compare them all. And is there a combination that, uh, is there one that works the best or are there combinations that will work better? And then I'm going to cover some last thing here, and that is what we, a new term which we call metalomics. This is not metabolomics. This is metalomics, <laughs> dealing with metals. And this is something that was, I have to credit Laurel Crosby, who's decided to do this. She's an environmental engineer by training. That's why she thought of this. Um, and uh, there's the instrument that you use for this. It's, it's very simple. It's a mass spectrometer. You can measure this. Um, uh, you then you, you have a, a you generate a plasma and then you can analyze it and here's the uh, periodic table for for chemists and you basically can do all of these simultaneously. And then other nice thing about it is you can do hair uh, because the hair uh, it comes from cells and you can measure the metals in the hair. Uh, the, 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 this is clear; it's valid but it's easy. <laughs> uh, we have to figure out whether it's valid. Uh, and so, in fact, we can get hair samples sent to us all over the world. And so it makes it, blood doesn't work very well for that. It's much more expensive. But you can do blood analysis as well. Um, and one of the things that we look for is mercury. And uh, this is the World Health Standard. This is a, this is a control uh, population published, um, and most of the people are down here, but occasionally you can find some people uh, that, in fact, are very high. Um, and uh, if we then look at patients, uh, and this is, um, uh, this is hair, and uh, what we find in that hair is, uh, here's mercury, and in red, are the ones that are over the limit for the WHO safety level. So it comes out about 
a quarter to a third of the patients have a mercury level that's considered unacceptable. And one reason it's unacceptable is because the mercury can inhibit a number of key enzymes, especially in the mitochondria. So you want to get rid of it. <laughs> now, what we also observe, which I think is new, because we're doing all these different things, is selenium. And selenium is an essential metal or, or semi-metal. But every time we have, virtually every time we have high mercury, we have low selenium. And that's because selenium binds mercury. I think. Now that's good news because it can help sequester the, the, the mercury. But the problem is selenium is used for lots of things. And one of the things it's used for is converting T4 to T3. Many patients report low levels of T3. It could very well be because of low selenium. Uh, th these are also a number of other enzymes that are used selenium. Uh, it's used in free radical scavenging. And there's a lot of oxidative damage in the patients. It could be because of low selenium. Trivial to measure this. So the reason to point this out is patients ought to be looking at this. It's easy to supplement. And, um, and the other thing that we observe is uranium. We don't know why. <laughs> but there are some patients, like this uh, lady from Finland, very high uranium compared to the other patients, and low selenium. And selenium probably binds to the uranium as well. Uh, and the other ones that are high are all from California. So I'm guessing it's our earthquake that's throwing up uranium or something like that. I don't know why uranium's high. And we don't know the medical consequences of high uranium. Let's figure that out. Oh, and here's just one. Uh, I just have one. That's, this is the last slide. Uh, there's one case where uh, we found uh, a case report where there was high, re high uh, mercury and then it was removed. And, uh, and this is just a, 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 a fatigue index showed that it, it looked like it got better. So that's not great data, but just from the literature saying that if you remove mercury, it might make things better. Uh, there's no report in here whether they looked at selenium or not. So the selenium is likely to also uh, be low and probably should be supplemented. It's easy to supplement. You can go to, you can buy selenium pills to take. But I, I want to warn everybody that low-level low selenium is bad. High-level selenium is probably worse. <laughs> so, uh, and there's a general rule here that I think sometimes the patients miss. And, and that is, if a little bit is good, doesn't mean a lot is better. <laughs> And I think the best thing to keep your, in your mind is uh, if you are cooking something, a little dash of salt will make it taste better. A handful of salt into your dish is awful. <laughs> and just keep that in mind because there's a real tendency to think uh, it, more must be better. It could be very toxic. So uh, with that, I'm going to close. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. Um, very interested to see you push towards metabolomics and being close to Melbourne, I just need to ask um, yeah, Paul Gooley, Neil McGregor, Chris Armstrong, etc. have done a lot of work in this field. How are you collaborating with them? And if you've run some metabolomic screens, have you found similar results to what have been found previously at Bio21? Yeah, I, I tried to cover here some of the things that would be beneficial to the patients, uh, more so than some of our other kinds of research that we've been doing, um, especially those which are too preliminary to really totally understand. Uh, we have a lot of sequence data. We have a lot of metabolomics data, uh, but it requires a massive analysis. Uh, we, we, of course, send everything to Neil, uh, or he has access to it. He wanted to send it to him. He just accesses it. Um, uh, and, and, and several other people are accessing our database as well to, uh, to analyze, and that's great. Um, yeah. Thank you, that was really interesting. Uh, just one question on the uh, electrical impedance testing, which 
looks really um, intriguing. Have you looked at any other patient groups? You've looked at normals to see how they go. The, no, Non-CFS patients, in other words. Yeah, the only ones we've looked at are uh, healthy individuals. Uh, a lot of those are uh, people around Stanford, they're volunteer. Uh, it's actually easier to get the patients than the controls. Because <laughs> there's a reason the patients will come to us, the healthy controls say, uh, you know, I don't want to have a blood sample. Um, uh, so it's, it's more difficult to get the healthy. But we try to be very careful that they're really healthy. Uh, we take a lot of uh, analysis, uh, you know. Uh, and it's really surprising that you'll get people in, say they're healthy, and, he's, and you try to question them, and you say, well, actually, I was just diagnosed with cancer. Uh, <laughs> or some other, you know, I, I, well, I have an autoimmune disease. Uh, you know, there's, uh, uh, people think of themselves as always healthy no matter what they have. So you have to really question them a lot to make sure that they don't have any disease. Now, that comes to a problem, and we've been thinking about this a little bit now. Uh, the, the one that we'd like to do is MS because MS is frequently misdiagnosed. Uh, and, it's, and so I begin looking into that. And, and there's a reason it's misdiagnosed because MS patients have the same symptoms as chronic fatigue syndrome. The only difference is that you can get brain imaging and you can say, no, they have MS because you can see the images. And then I was talking to MS physicians and saying, well, could they also have chronic fatigue syndrome? And they said, no, they only have one disease. And so all those symptoms are because of MS. Thank you. Thank you.